Today we finish and dyno our LSA, plus a tech tip to help with manifold selection. Engine power is back, and today we're continuing on with our 427-inch LSA build. Now, this engine is found in CTSV Cadillacs and Z01 Camaros. It's a stout performer right from the factory and responds awesome to bolt-on parts. Now, here's a quick look at what got us to this short block status. We invited a couple of guys from the School of Automotive Machinists to help out with the short block. They gave us a hand removing all the stock components so we could show you what this engine was made of. Then we showed you how to set up bearing clearances, added a Lunati Signature Series crankshaft with a 4 and an eighth inch stroke, hung DSS Racing custom pistons on Lunati H-beam rods, and buttoned up the rotating assembly. Next, the camshaft was installed and degreed. The lifters went in with their retaining trays, and underneath, the stock pan was installed and aligned. Today, we're completing the engine with all of these trick parts, starting with the cylinder head. These are factory castings that received a modified LS3 CNC program developed down at the school. The valve sizes are 2165 on the intake and 1590 on the exhaust. On the port, the stock one went from 260 cc all the way up to 280 cc. And on the exhaust side, the port went from 89 cc to 95 cc with said program. The flow numbers speak for themselves. On the left are the stock flow numbers, and on the right are the new numbers from the CNC SAM port. The gains are significant, and to think that this is all done on a factory casting is pretty cool. As lift increases, the flow also increases at an alarming rate, showing the benefit of a well-designed port. The combustion chamber is just over 69 cc's. Sam also performed a 45 degree five angle valve job, which complemented those flow numbers. They're not ready to install yet. We still have to swap out the valve springs. To match the camshaft, Brian Tooley Racing also sent us the 660 inch lift dual platinum valve springs along with titanium retainers and locks. Here's a factory beehive spring to show you a comparison. They're a quick change with our MTI compressor we got from Goodson. For all of you building an LS, here's a quick tip. GM puts thread locker on head bolts when they get assembled, so when you pull them out for a head swap, some of that thread locker stays in the block and can cause it to jam up or gall when a new one goes in. So do yourself a favor and order a head bolt clean out tap from Goodson. The LSA uses an M11 2.0 thread. This cleanout tap has a long reach to make cleaning super simple. Our head gaskets are a multi-layer steel design that are also used on the LS9. A lot of guys reuse them without any trouble. Head studs are no longer an issue to find for the LSA thanks to Livernoy Motorsports. These studs allow for greater clamping force to keep the cylinder head in place under the increased cylinder pressure created from modified LSAs. Now the cylinder heads can be guided to the decks, and ARP's ultra torque lube is applied to the threads and the top of the washers. We're torquing them in two passes, first at 40 pound feet, the second at 70. The small top studs are torqued to 25 pound feet. With one head in place, there's still one more to go. These chromoly push rods are 5 16 in diameter and 7 inch 400 thousandths long. They also have an 80 thousandths wall thickness. Now we're ready for the rocker arms. This is a factory rocker and trunnion. Now due to the low lift on the factory camshaft, these don't have very much travel. Anytime you go to a higher lift cam, you want to install an aftermarket trunnion kit like this one from Brian Tooley Racing. Now as you can see from the angle of the bolt, it allows the rocker arm to move a lot further to compensate for that lift. The trunnion body also makes the rocker arm a lot stronger. With the rocker stand in place, We'll install them, making sure to have the cylinder at TDC so the intake and exhaust valve is closed. This practice will eliminate stripping out the threads in the head. Since these use an aftermarket fastener, we'll torque them to 30 pound-feet. Sealing up the top of the block is the original valley cover. At this point, we're ready to start prepping the supercharger for installation. But first, there's something we want to show you on the factory blower inlet over on the display engine. This is what the factory inlet behind the throttle body looks like. There's plenty of material that can be removed to improve airflow. 
like the treatment this one received at SAM. Notice the larger surface area and super smooth finish. This will promote better airflow into the blower. After the break, we're prepping the supercharger. We're back, and our first step for the prep work is to remove the entire front snout. This will give us access to the factory isolator that is known to be noisy and fail on modified LSAs. The factory one is spring-loaded, and the spring is hardened and actually wears into the shaft it rides on. Mecco Motorsports sent us this solid piece that is the solution to the problem. To install it, simply align it on the dowels and press it on by hand. Now it's time to change the factory blower pulley, which measures in at 2.95 inches, to the new Metco Motorsports one that is 2.5 inches. With the hub pressed on, I can install the pulley using the supplied hardware. Now the cover is installed with a little blue Loctite on the fastener. High performance gray silicone from Loctite is placed on the mating surface between the blower housing and the inlet. As it goes on, you have to align the isolator with the dowels on the shaft of the blower, which is super simple. With it torqued in place, the blower is laid down on the table. The gasket for the intercooler is installed, along with the factory GM intake gaskets. Now they're positioned and held on by the manifold intake bolts. Before we drop it on, check out the port work on the intake runner. This is actually port matched to the cylinder head. And to keep them from binding during installation, a little window cleaner helps them slide into place. Now it's time to drop the supercharger on our bulletproof long block. The bolts will act as a guide to get it in position. It gets torqued to eight pound feet. The lid can be installed using more factory fasteners, also torqued to eight pound feet. Metco also supplied us with this Innovators West harmonic damper for 09 and up CTSV engines. It's designed with an adapter plate that accepts interchangeable pulleys offered by Metco. Since our crankshaft was not keyed, I did some of my signature surgery and put a quarter inch hole to create a location to pin the balancer. Now a dowel is installed to eliminate the balancer from rotating on the crank. And an ARP balancer bolt is used to finish it up. A Metco crank pulley ring is 9550 in diameter and machined from billet aluminum. The black anodized finish will keep it looking good. The factory water pump goes on next. We ordered the Chevy Performance CTSV accessory drive kit from Summit Racing. Now it has all the brackets, hardware, and accessories that we need. The first part from the kit is the bracket for the alternator. It's located on the driver's side of the block. Attaching to it is a factory CTSV 150 amp alternator. Next in line is to attach the power steering reservoir to its main bracket. Now the bracket goes onto the block and the hose is slipped onto the reservoir. Now the power steering pump is installed, attaching the hose at the same time. The pulley has to be pressed on using an installation tool. Driving it on any other way will result in damage to the pump shaft. Now this cast bracket is installed followed by the aluminum tensioner bracket and the tensioner itself. The Metco tensioner pulley is made from high-grade billet aluminum and is fitted with dual bearings for serious durability. This Metco idler pulley for the supercharger belt is 100 millimeters in diameter. Now anytime a smaller supercharger pulley is used, it increases the chance of belt slippage causing a loss in boost. This idler increases belt wrap on the supercharger pulley, increasing the tension, which helps eliminate slippage. The last part of the drive is Metco's idler for the blower belt. And to seal up the valve train, the factory valve covers and coil packs are going back on. And this beast of an LS is headed to the docking cart. Now we're in the dyno room for the final portion of this LSA build. Now the things we still have to do are install the throttle body, the headers, the air inlet, and plumb the heat exchanger for the intercooler under this lid. Then come the injectors and finally the harness. Now as we install all these parts, you'll learn a little more about them. 
The throttle body is a billet aluminum 102 millimeter drive-by wire from Nick Williams. It uses a six pin late model connector and comes with all the electronics so you don't have to disassemble your factory one. And the throttle blade clears just fine. Speartech fuel injection system sent us this mass air meter and inlet pipe, along with a conical filter. Next are a set of Hooker Super Comp headers we have ran on several engines in here. They're a full length design with inch and three quarter primaries and a three inch collector. The stock injectors in these LSAs flow 56.4 pounds an hour at 58 PSI of fuel pressure. We're stepping them up to these 90 pound an hour Deech works. Now Speartex injector and coil pack harness is installed. It uses all factory connectors and has a low profile to tuck down nice and neat. The harness is a 58X for late model LSs. Now this is a standalone harness for the engine side only. It comes with a check engine light and diagnostic connector so you can hook up an OBD2 scan tool in case that light comes on. Now something I like about these is it has a high temp woven covering to give it that show car look. The connectors are labeled so there's no mistake of where they go. This harness truly is plug and play. The ECM is an E38 controller and snaps right into place. Speartech also sent an electronic throttle pedal to match the harness and ECM. Now we can tighten the supplied O2 sensors and hook up a few power sources. Royal Purple XPR 5W30 goes in our Goodson Prime tank and we'll air it up to about 70 PSI. Priming LS engines this way is a must. We have good pressure. Weapon X Motorsports custom built this heat exchanger for the car we're putting this LSA into, which we'll show you a little later. Now this thing has a larger core and holds more capacity than a factory unit. Pushing the coolant through it is a Lingenfelter high flow pump. To further assist the cooling, a blower fan goes in place. Now it's ready for some tuning from Ed Hutchings of HighTechTuning.com. There are a lot of misconceptions surrounding the tuning industry and its effect on tailpipe emissions. Many people believe tuning is dirty or increases tailpipe emissions. Tuning is a process of optimizing an engine. Whenever you optimize an engine, you typically decrease tailpipe emissions and increase fuel mileage. With it up to temperature and a preliminary tune from Ed, it's time. All right, guys, 93 octane pump gas. I'm gonna make the first pull from 25 to 4,500. I saw that needle move pretty good. That looked pretty mean right there for a first pull. Look at that. 726 pound-feet of torque and 596 horsepower, and it is climbing. The initial numbers look great. It's still a pretty, pretty conservative tune right now. It should make 760, 770 on accident. We have a great idea of what this engine's gonna make, and we're well on our way. We'll see after the break. We're back, and it's time to let this LSA show off what it's got. All right, so you added two degrees of timing. Yes, two degrees wide open. I'm going to leave the uh, starting um, RPM at 2,500, but we're going to carry it to 6,500 this time. Sounds good. Rev limiter? Could have been. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 794 horsepower and 776 pound-feet of torque. On the first pull. First full pull. Unbelievable. You know what that is? That's the stairway to heaven. <laughs> With the rev limiter up to 7,200 RPM and a little fuel added to the entire table, another pull is in order, this time to 6,800 RPM. It lost some power from the additional fuel down to 775. The torque hung in there at 777 pound-feet. But we're close to where we're supposed to be, that's for sure. Actually, we are, we've exceeded everything that we've actually thought it was gonna do. <laughs> we're going to let the engine cool down quite a bit. This thing is working really well with the large uh, expansion tank. It's showing about 82 degrees right after that uh, 6,800 RPM pull. And pull a little fuel back out. Hell yeah. 
I seen the needle. Right I seen the needle go. <laughs> I saw it. That's it. 800! 800! 794 on torque. Nice. Good job, nice. man. Nice job. Yeah! Boom! Where, where the torque? Wow, look at that graph. Peak torque of 794 was at the start of the pull at 2,500 RPM, and it didn't fall below 700 pound-feet until 6,000. The power speaks for itself, peaking at 6,200. Nice job, man. Thanks, man. This is a forged piston with a larger top ring-in gap. Uh, the biggest problem with the GM pistons are, number one, they're hyper-eutectic. Number two, the top ring-in gap is so close, you know, if you're a little too aggressive, you can butt the top ring and, and lift a ring land. This, you have little or no chance of doing that. Uh, the compression is also a little lower, so it, it widens the tuning window. We all feel there's a little left in it. So with HP Tuner software, we added one more degree of timing and cooled the engine down for this. Nice. <laughs> nice. 816, baby. 797 foot-pounds of torque. Nice. That's Very unbelievable. Nice. Horsepower through the mid-range is sick. It cracked 800 at 5,700 RPM with a peak of 816 at 6,100. <laughs> that is pretty cool right there. That's nice. This is nice job. wild. You, nice job. Very nice. Nice job. Thank you. Thank you. This engine is a perfect example of modern technology optimized to its fullest potential. Basically, we took all the stock architecture that's been slightly modified and added a stroked rotating assembly to make an engine that's bulletproof, has great drivability, not to mention amazing power on 93 octane pump gas across its entire operating range. Carbureted intake manifolds flood our performance aftermarket. Now there are several different brands and the prices vary to accommodate entry level gearheads all the way up to serious racers. Now they also come in several different designs to accommodate the type of engine they're going on and what that engine is going to be used for. This tech tip will help you decide which one works best for your engine. You've seen us use several different types on engines built for the street, strip, or circle track. One thing they share in common was they were cast from aluminum, which saves a lot of weight over cast iron ones. Aluminum also makes port work a lot easier for you guys who like to do it at home. It's not as hard on your carbide burrs, your die grinders, or your cartridge rolls. Plus, aluminum is soft, so you remove the material faster than cast iron. The three types of manifolds we're going to talk about are a dual plane, an air gap, and a single plane. Now a lot of people think that a single plane is for racing purposes only and a dual plane is for the street, but that's not true. There are several dual planes on race cars as well. Now they actually use this in several circle track classes as a spec manifold. A dual plane manifold has a split opening directly underneath the carburetor mounting pad. Now each side feeds a bank of four cylinders which are fed every other firing order or 180 degrees of crankshaft rotation. Now these manifolds do have a smaller plenum area compared to a single plane, therefore have a different operating range. Dual planes typically have an RPM range from 15 to 6,500 RPMs. That means they have broad power and work really good in the low to mid RPM range. Now a perfect example of that is normal street driving or the occasional pass down the drag strip. Now for you circle track racers, this manifold will help get your car off the corner and down those short straightaways even better. The air gap is a dual plane as well, but it actually has a gap between the plenum floor and the valley. This is to allow the runners to stay cooler for a denser air charge during operation. The last and final intake manifold in our lineup is a single plane. Now these things can be ran on the street and are a good match for stroker engines due to larger cylinder volume. Now they usually have a typical operating range from 2500 to 8500 RPM. They can be a little crude at idle and low RPMs, but if you have a stout cam, gear ratio, and big cubic inches, this can be a power performing choice you can make. There are other types of manifolds, but we covered the basics. Now I hope this helps you determine which manifold works best for your engine and your driving style. We know you're dying to find out where the LSA is going. Well, it's not a Cadillac, it's not a Camaro, and it's not a Corvette. It's this awesome 93 Caprice Classic four-door. Now, we know it's a granny car, and that's why we're naming it Gray Hair White Knuckle. Now, you saw the power and torque graph, so you know that thing's going to be a true sleeper. That's all the time we have for now. We'll see you around.